They've got a license to talk. Shocking. Positively shocking. And the words are for your ears only. I think you got the point. Welcome to The Words Are Not Enough. In episode 5 of The Words Are Not Enough, we discuss Daniel Craig's pick for the director of Bond 25 and whether Thomas Newman is returning to score the film. Plus, we give you our spoiler-filled thoughts on Kingsman, The Golden Circle, and our picks for who should direct a Bond film. Stay tuned. <laughs> well, hey everyone, and welcome to episode number five of The Words Are Not Enough. I am Griffin 008 Schiller, and I'm joined here today by my lovely co host, Brody 005 Cerevelli. Hey, Brody, say hello to everyone. Hello, hello, how's everyone doing? Having a good day? Having a good week? That's good. I'm glad to hear it. Yes, there's the the, the nonverbal response. They're they're responding to you, but you can't really hear them. So of course, it's, oh, I hear them. It's okay. I hear them in my heart. <laughs> my heart? In your, they, they respond to you in your heart. <laughs> so how, how's it been? You know, how's how's the week been? Is you, you watched a lot of Bond films? Have you watched uh, some some espionage uh, stuff? I have. I've, I haven't watched any Bond, but I have watched a um, a Bond pastiche, if you will. A, um, a uh-huh. little, little movie came out, uh, Kingsman. The Golden Circle. Oh yes. So uh, I, uh, what is I it? That. The, the 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 king king's man. Yes. There's only yes. one of them. There is a king's, king's man. man Singular. And he's yes. looking for a <laughs> a a yellow circle or something like that. I, circle, I don't know. I, right. I heard yes, something yes, yes. came out. Yeah. With the help of his American cousin, state man. Yes. Right. 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 It's a, <laughs> like a small little indie film. I don't know how many of you guys saw mm-hmm. that. I did. did I Didn't wasn't able to. Release. But. No, no, right, no. right. I mean, I'm yeah. not hearing good things. Not, not, not good. You know, it only has a fifty percent on Rotten Tomatoes, so that Ouch. must mean that it sucks, oh, right? Yeah, absolutely. Yes, yes, absolutely. When have critics oh. ever been wrong about anything ever? <laughs> <laughs> yes. <laughs> oh, we could have a whole rant on Rotten Tomatoes right now, but oh, that's boy. probably that's probably not a good not the idea. Venue, not the venue for that one. No, this is not the platform at all. This is just like we, we can. Came here to listen to James Bond. Yeah. Let's rant about come, Rotten Tomatoes. Come for Bond and stay for the uh, the critique of the current the current climate and criticism. <laughs> yeah, that's so true. And it, by by the way, since we're on this topic, we are not blaming Rotten Tomatoes. It's actually really just the state of the movie industry, uh, our film criticism in general. Yes, yes, it's very. It's oh man, it's an interesting time to be a critic. I feel. But it's again, awful. we are segueing into a subject that is not <laughs> not uh, not what the hell? I'm telling you at the beginning of this. Oh, I gotta catch a screening. I gotta shower. Oh, I gotta make this quick. And now we're ranting on about like Rotten Tomatoes. What is going on? Oh boy. Oh man. Well, hopefully you all have had a very pleasant week. Um, hopefully you guys saw Kingsman: The Golden Circle last week. We mm-hmm. did. You're gonna hear our thoughts on those a little bit later on in Brother from Langley. We're Excellent. bringing it back again this oh, week. Yes. So finally, has it's gonna be a good content. time. Right, but first, as always, we have to dive into some Bond rumors slash news, starting with Tomorrow Never Lies. All right, so the first one here has to do with some statements that Craig has apparently made regarding who he wants to direct the the next Bond film, and subsequently his last Bond film, Bond 25. Excuse me. Oh, God, I can't can't talk. I'm getting I got a little frog in my throat. So, uh, <laughs> according to the Daily Mail's Baz Bamigoye, B- Bamig Boye, that is a very interesting last name. I can't yes. say names, so we're gonna call him Good Old Baz. Yes, old according Baz to the Daily, Daily Mail. Mail's Baz, um, <laughs> Denis Villeneuve has spoken with Daniel Craig along with producers Barbara Broccoli and Michael G. Wilson about coming on board as director for Bond 25. Furthermore, the report indicates that Craig has thrown his weight behind Villeneuve, which if you have any inkling of a brain, <laughs> why wouldn't you? Um, of course. But, and he has his personal pick, and he has him as his personal pick to helm the project. Uh, this corroborates with a report from Deadline in June that claimed Villeneuve is one of the three frontrunners for the coveted job. And a couple episodes back, I'm pretty sure we mentioned this. Yes. Uh, some of the top frontrunners, obviously, Jan Damage. Uh, Denis Villeneuve and then uh, David McKenzie, who did Hell or High Water. Yes. Those were the three front runners at the time. So yes, this is uh, this 
definitely makes sense. Mm-hmm. However, a more recent Ooh. report from Deadline has thrown some doubt on Villeneuve's uh, availability, um, basically stating that he is in early talks with Sony to direct a Cleopatra biopic. Very oh interesting project. Um, the report comes on top of a Dune re- remake that Villeneuve is also rumored to be attached to. This is this is new, no new news here. Dune has been uh, Denis Villeneuve's passion project for the longest time. It has been long rumored that he was going to do the project, and I'm pretty sure it was actually confirmed that he uh, w- is set to do the Dune remake whenever that is going to happen. I'm, I'm pretty sure yes. he's already in pre-production on it. He's It's been basically his dream for like <laughs> ever to remake Dune, which I am very excited for. That's a little off topic, but <laughs> so looking at all of this, um, you know, the Daily Ma- Mail's uh, Baz uh, Bamig Boye, I'm, I think I nailed that one, right? That I was think his last did. name. Yeah, I think that yeah, was like, I did. on the money. Right. Uh, for any of you who doubt him, he's actually a fairly credible source when it comes to Bond. He, um, w- when Spectre was coming out, he, you know, had a lot of rumors He was that were circulating that uh, were coming from him that I, I don't remember what the exact rumors were, but he, he's pretty on top of his Bond stuff. And so when a report about Bond comes out from him, you know, it has some, you know, weight behind it, which is mainly why one of the reasons we're discussing this, other than the fact that it is Bond news. So taking all of that into account, Brody, what are your thoughts on this rumor here that, that Craig actually wants um, Denis Villeneuve to direct Bond twenty five, and what do you what are your thoughts on maybe the the chances that he will actually direct it? Because I mean, we got the Cleopatra biopic here, we've got the Dune remake. He's a very very busy guy, so yes, yeah, and, and rightfully so. The guy is an incredible filmmaker, and you just watch <laughs> any of his movies from Enemy to Prisoners to Sicario to apparently Blade Runner twenty forty nine. It's getting rave reviews. Oh, so yes. I I just want to get your quick thoughts on on this here. Oh uh, well, yeah. I mean. I'm pretty much going to echo what you've already said in that, duh, of course this is Craig's first and, like, you know, most, most um, I guess, favorite pick because oh, yeah. he's incredible. He's, he's just a really, really talented guy. He's someone right. that even if he hadn't been on the list, like on the short list, I would have wanted to do it. So yep. Yep. it's kind of, a, it's kind of a, uh, a, a dream pick in that regard. Um, mm-hmm. As for the likelihood, I don't know, just because of, I don't know, uh, this Cleopatra biopic, if the if the distribution rights remain at Sony, then Denis doing a, another project with Sony doesn't necessarily mean a bad thing. It just means they'll just do it like – Mm-hmm. One after the other, and um, and actually, if if the rights do remain with Sony, I think that the likelihood of him doing the film is actually higher. They'll be like, "Hey, direct Bond twenty five for us. We'll give you Cleopatra." Boom. That is true. That could be part of the negotiations. So that this could yeah, all be, this could all yeah. be part of the same story that we just like we're getting fragments of. Um, right, right. And on top of that, yeah, but the Dune thing does. I, I don't know. I. I haven't heard a ton about it lately, so maybe that's what, maybe it's like um, right something that'll be later on down the track. It seems like it'll be a huge undertaking, so it, it wouldn't be surprised if pre-production yeah, on that sure. lasts quite a while, and he could fit another film in. I mean, not that Bond is a small film to fit in between a massive project and another massive project, <laughs> but, it, but but I feel like it doesn't it doesn't have like the all of the the, the moving parts that like a giant sci fi epic has. Yeah, so. exactly. Yeah, and, and I feel like this. I mean, I, I want it to happen. So <laughs> if they can, right? No, to make I'm, it work, I'm right there with you, man. I, yeah. I completely agree. Like, it's he just has that style that I think would work well for a Bond film. Yes. Um, yeah. And I mean, on top of the fact that he's a master of storyteller, his all I to this date. I mean, I have not seen Blade Runner 2049, but if you were to if you were to believe the the early reactions, apparently it's another ball being knocked out of the park. He has not made a bad film like ever <laughs> i mean like right, yeah. he's just that good so yeah no i i, I completely agree i i just i want to believe it so maybe that's clouding my judgment i want to believe that he's gonna do it right i, <laughs> so, I i'm i'm right there with you like being, i i want objective. to believe that he's but, but here's the other thing uh, if you were to believe it, but if you're to believe all this stuff and then take into account the, the stuff we've heard about Jan Demange, who came in with this really great story, blew the, the, the pitch meeting away, the board, Eon, all of them, blew them away with this story. Um, you know, 
what's going to happen to him? Is he just, are we just hearing about Denis Villeneuve because he's got a movie coming out and because, you know, he's one of the top three in the running or, or is Jan Damange really looking like he's not going to be in the project anymore? Um, well, I think if this turns out to be true with the Daniel Craig aggressively pursuing him, uh, pursuing, uh, Villeneuve, I think there's right. a possibility that maybe the, the Jan Damange story isn't even true. It was, it did, it did yeah, come from like a, it's a, a possibility. A, yeah. It's a possibility. Um, it did, it did come from a, um, a lesser known source. Not to say that's not true. Oh, yeah, it did come from a Tumblr blog. <laughs> it did come from a Tumblr blog. And, um, <laughs> so, you know, that, that, that I already had my doubts about that rumor, uh, based on that. But for the sake of argument, you know, it's it's more fun to just sort of assume that it's may, may be true. But, right, because I, I I think he actually would be a good pick, Jan Damage. I mean, oh, based off of just yeah. seventy one. And if you were to believe the rumor that his story blew them away, I I think that he'd be a great choice. So yep. I, you know, mm-hmm. so but yeah, if both are true and that uh, like Jan Damage blew them away with a pitch meeting, and then Villeneuve is the one that Craig wants. I almost don't know which way I'd rather it go because personally I love Villeneuve's style, but if Jan de March has something that is he's very passionate about, that right. almost makes me want to go in that direction despite my uh, my adoration for um, for Denis. So yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. I'm right. I, mean, I think that's a good, uh, a good way to look at it. Hopefully they don't steal Jan de story and then just give it to Villeneuve. Right. Be well, really I mean that's that, that's do. the other thing. Demange uh, could write the script and uh, Villeneuve could direct. However, I don't. I, I I don't see that happening for whatever reason. Yeah, they, they seem like they're both like very artistic directors. Yeah, and so yeah. I, they're not like guns for hire. Like like let's take your idea and give it to him, and you just don't, <laughs> you just work with the material we give you. Like I can't see that happening. But yeah, 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 it's possible. Who knows? Like, <laughs> right? I mean, you know, anything's possible. I guess if you're to believe any of these rumors. But I, it's right. a little little interesting little tidbit here to to think of and and i think especially since daniel craig is coming back they're gonna give him anything he wants so yeah, uh, if, if he thing. wants villeneuve they're gonna try and find a way to give villeneuve to direct so uh fascinating stuff here uh we'll we'll come back to the director rumor mill in a little bit that's actually going to be our topic for shaken but heard as i'm sure you Ooh. heard in the intro um <laughs> but moving on to another topic here that is uh <laughs> You know, another rumor, Ugh. whether you believe it or not, it's just a little disappointing. So apparently <laughs> Omega Underground, uh, they've a- allegedly come across a production listing for Bond 25 that, while not detailing a director or story synopsis, appears to reveal that composer Thomas Newman will in fact return to the franchise to score Bond 25. So mm. Newman scored Skyfall, Inspector, and he's pretty well known for being uh, a frequent collaborator with uh, Sam Mendes, so that that it makes sense why he would be brought on to do uh, Skyfall Inspector. But uh, this production list suggests that he may be sticking around past the the Sam Mendes Bond era. So um, I know we both have very strong opinions on this. Once again, I'm going <laughs> to let you uh, st- take the lead on this. But um, Thomas Newman returning yeah. for Bond 25 uh, thoughts. <laughs> Are you fucking insane? Are you kidding me? Um, <laughs> oh boy, this is like this will get the, uh, the the nerd rage going inside of me. This is yeah. disappointing. I mean, yeah. like, okay, so here's the thing, right? Um, I have a complicated relationship with uh, Thomas Newman's Bond scores because they're good. They are good. Yeah, they're um, fine. I don't have a problem with them. Specifically, Skyfall has a very, very good. Um, soundtrack it's the problem is he did the same soundtrack for spectre um more or less lazy it was yeah. it, it, it and i feel like it probably wasn't absolute laziness i feel like he had it was it was built up to be a direct sequel so his idea was i'm going to take themes from this this uh story this like motifs and whatever and i'm going mm-hmm. to put them in here to call back to skyfall and that's mm-hmm. fine but it was like every action cue was an action cue, a rearrangement of an action cue. Yeah, from everything Skyfall. just like blended together. And yeah. so it was kind of just really bland. That's to say, there were some standout moments. Like Inspector, I think I've well, I've talked to you about this before. One of my favorite like iterations of like the James Bond theme is in the Spectre soundtrack. Like it's good. It's very mm-hmm. very good. Mm-hmm. But 
it, it was just so bland in comparison to like you had the stuff that um not to bring a name up every episode, but David Arnold did. <laughs> um, like he did a direct sequel in in Quantum of Solace, and Quantum of Solace. What, whether or not you think what what you think about the movie or even the title song, maybe one of his best soundtracks. Like he is just it's, constantly it's really good. It, it, he just constantly really pumps good. out original, like really really good stuff. Uh, yeah. Even when he's doing a sequel, and he was able to pull like he pulled Vespa's theme back, and he pulled the the, mm-hmm. the little quantum motif um, that we heard a little bit, which sounded a little bit like um, the motif he used for uh, Gustav Graves, but it wasn't the same. It wasn't the exact same, um, which was you know what you want out of you know a soundtrack, right? right yeah. Um, and, and and on top of that, something that um, that that disappointed me about Thomas Newman's scores was that he didn't collaborate enough with the, the the artist doing the title song to incorporate that music that that, right. that melody into his score which is something that David Arnold like prided himself on doing and when he wasn't shafted out of a title song did very well um mm-hmm. yeah so, i mean yeah, he, just, he did do that little uh orchestral um in, instrumental version of writings on the wall that played yeah, and during he did, and he did one in the, skyfall as well the, when, that played Right, right, but but like it like wasn't. Off. Yeah, it, it, yeah, it was just like a, oh, let's just play the song because you know we can just do that. Yeah, and it, I, and it, it I, wasn't I really out, like oh, yeah. I found out the oh, reason no, go why. Ahead, go ahead. I found out the reason why for, uh, that is it's because um, it, with this whole like this this whole uh, like film music world, um, if if Thomas Newman wasn't directly involved in the production of the song, he has to pay royalties to use the melody. Even though it's in the same yeah. project, so which is just ridiculous. <laughs> this is just dumb. So like, David, it is so dumb. Yeah, David Arnold would always, well, except when he got you know shafted um, two times <laughs> that that happened. Um, he was he worked directly with the artist making the title song, so that he would he got like a, a writer credit or whatever on the song, and then he used right. the melody throughout. He interwove it into his score, and so Thomas Newman, I, I, I doubt he was pushed out of the room. When it came to uh, like Adele or Sam Smith, like doing the song, so he just isn't interested, I guess, in doing those title songs. Which means, and he's also not interested in having to pay royalties to use that melody. So we end up with just like a weird shoehorned in melody. The one time he was willing to pay for it, and then yeah, the rest of just, the score it just is feels a little right. It feels a little weird. Just kind of yeah. like, a, oh, remember the ta- the song from the beginning? Cool. We'll just throw it in here because it'll it'll work or whatever. Yeah, and it's a shame because those songs have like nice melodies. It's just it, it wasn't well incorporated, and I, I want that. I want that. That's part of the Bond sound. Everyone mentions right. like, the, the obvious things, like the strings and the big brass and all that. But just having that main song that represents the movie it gives the movie its own identity. Mm-hmm. That is so important, and. The fact that he hasn't done that, and he's not the only one. There are other composers who've done Bond films who haven't done that. It's just especially egregious when he when he's done it, and it's just like it's like, yeah, come I on. agree. I agree. On top of all the other things, you couldn't just spare the time to give this movie its own musical identity in any way. That's a little disappointing, right? It just feels like yeah. it just feels like like Tom Thomas just generic Thomas <laughs> Newman Bond music, which is my problem with it. I think Thomas Newman. I, I'm just gonna get this out of the way first. I think Thomas Newman is one of the best composers working in the business. He's one of my. He is in yep. my top five probably for favorite composers ever. So it's not like I, I am particularly hating on him. <laughs> He's incredibly talented. He has such a unique style. His score for American Beauty is oh. probably one of my favorite scores of all time. It's absolutely incredible. It's haunting, yeah. But it, it's yeah, exactly. It's haunting. It, but you, but you look at his work on the Bond films, and you know, I think he did. I think he did a good job in in Skyfall. It was because it was the first time we heard it. But then you look at Spectre, and you're like, oh, okay. So if he were just to continue doing Bond films, this is what we would get. It would just be the same sound over and over again. Generic Thomas yeah. Newman Bond action cues, not a whole lot. And that was my huge issue with the Spectre score, even though they have a. A, a few uh, great tracks in there. It was just him reusing a lot of the stuff that he already did in um, Skyfall. And and before you go say, oh, all the composers and Bond reuse similar themes. Yes, but not to the extent that Thomas Newman did. Sure, yeah. the, you know they'll reuse the Bond theme. They'll reuse certain Your motifs, heart. little action <laughs> like uh, hits or stuff like that. 
But I feel like if you were to lift a cue out of Skyfall, plop it in Spectre, it would sound exactly the same. You know, whereas yeah. if you do, if you look at some of the previous Bond films, if you look through that and you were to lift a cue out, uh, it might not work where you would place it in in another film, which is why it the, those scores are so good because they. Um, you know, even though they're they're kind of like this uh, repeating stuff, they they give it a little bit uh, of a different spin on it, a new identity. Um, and and this is once again, all of this is why I gave I give Thomas Newman credit for what he did on Skyfall because it was the first yes. time we heard it. And it, just coming out of the gate, I think it's a great Thomas Newman Bond score. But like I mentioned, seeing that he just repeated that inspector mm, i you know i think it's time to either bring david arnold back who clearly oh, just knows how to do this i mean he is the man when it comes to james bond i i'm just going to say it i mean he's right up there with john barry oh um, yeah you know i i would i would just i'd rather see someone like that come in or or, or you know bring someone new in if you don't want to bring David Arnold back for whatever reason, even though <laughs> I, I can't imagine why, yeah. um, just give us someone new. Uh, maybe, you know, Michael Giacchino. I feel like he could do a decent job. He likes to use his brass, and that's something oh, that I feel yeah. the Newman scores were were lacking were the, the, uh, the brass. They, he, they didn't, that, that's they the didn't utilize yeah. the, the Bond theme and, and the high brass and the horns as much as previous composers, which is unique for one outing, but, you know, we got to get that stuff back because this is the, James okay, Bond. This, this is a weird nitpick I'm going to bring up very, um, very randomly. Um, yeah, go for it. For Inspector... There is one. He uses the wrong section of the Bond song at the at the Bond theme at the wrong moment. So, like the bit where Bond is like the the helicopter is nose diving, nose diving, and then it pulls up, and yeah. he goes. He plays da 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 da, da and it's like no, that's that, that that doesn't feel right when Bond does something <laughs> like that. It's dun 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 dun. You know what I mean? Like it's yeah. It, it just well, didn't, I mean, it just you know, he's know, trying that, to do something different, a little unique. Different. I know, but I mean, it, it's some things. It's like. It was building and building and building. I was like, oh, we're going to get like a really good, or even like, da 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 da. You know, there's, there's so many different sections of that, that theme that you could use. And he used the least climactic part of the song. And I was like, okay, this is fine. It sounds fine. Yeah, but it wasn't like, it didn't give me that like, that, like, fuck yeah, like kind yeah. of mood. And I feel like that's just kind of like the, the general vibe I got from a lot of his stuff inspector specifically um, right which is right. a shame but no uh, I, I i completely agree with you and once again it's not like we're hating on thomas newman no, yeah, incredibly yeah, yeah. talented composer i just would like to either see someone new or bring back the man who clearly just <laughs> knocks it out of the park every single time just david arnold please for the love of god give it to him um, <laughs> and once again, about, this is just a oh, rumor yeah. we have no idea if this is true in fact you know i don't know the likelihood of it being true is whatever you make of it, whether you trust uh, Omega underground or not, but yeah. um, it's just something that is worth bringing up. So that's why it could always be it. one of those. It could always be one of those things where like, um, like I, I was explaining to you when we came across the story, it could be one of those things like IMDB or something where it's just someone filled in the blanks with information from the previous film to sort of just round out the list. And it's not, because it's not, it, yeah. we have no indication yeah. this is an official, um, document because the, the the most we got from Omega Underground is that they they got it they didn't say where they yeah. got it they didn't yeah. say who yeah, they exactly. got it from um so yeah i mean it could be it could be anything but it's worth covering just because it's worth ranting about right. no Newman. it's i mean it's it's worth bringing up because it's a, it is um you know entirely possible they they, they could be looking to bring it back yeah. all right so actually, moving the interesting thing oh sorry one thing i was going to say the interesting thing about um Michael Giacchino that you mentioned or Giacchino whatever you say his name um mm-hmm. i feel like the the thing that gives me uh that that, that would inspire me to him, for him to do a um a Bond theme is his score for the Incredibles. Whew. Oh yeah, yes, that very. Yeah, 60s that's exactly spy. what I was thinking Ooh. of. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> no, it's he, dude. The the man knows how to do that that classic jazz like yeah. high brass like just Ooh. energy. Like he could do a really good job on on the score. I think so. If they're looking for someone new, he would be uh, someone's name that I'd throw into the ring. So easily. All right, moving on to the last topic here for uh, tomorrow never lies. A little bit of a sad news here, and just something we want to touch on briefly. Uh, mm-hmm. Bernie Casey, who played uh, Felix Leiter in the unofficial James Bond film Never 
Never Say Never Again, uh, has passed away. Uh, he died September 19th, 2017, at the age of 78 after a brief illness. And I, I Brody, we were talking about this earlier, but I think, you mm-hmm. know, regardless of what you think of uh, Never Say Never Again, I think it's unanimously agree that it is a it, it is not a good movie. <laughs> um, I, I think Casey's portrayal of... Uh, Felix Leiter was actually one of the bright spots in it. I, I really, yeah, yeah. I I really enjoyed what he brought to the table. Um, he, you know, he just he seemed to own the character in that that movie. He had so great I, chemistry I have to with say, Sean Connery. It was like, yeah, this- he he had great chemistry with Sean Connery. So I, you know, good good on him for making um making good of a kind of weird movie <laughs> situation you know um but yeah what do you, do you have any, any uh, thoughts or things you want to say on uh, bernie uh, I mean, casey I, i'm not too familiar with uh most of his career i know he was in the nfl um and i also know that like right, i'm right. not too sure what his acting credentials were beyond this film um but for what it's mm-hmm. worth in this film in never say never again he yeah like you said like he owned the role he didn't he didn't just play it as like oh you know I'm going to play Felix because, I mean, I mean, Felix didn't have a ton of personality in some of the earlier Bond films. Um, well, and, and, and here's here's the thing. So, no, sorry to mean, interrupt you here. But um, before, um, oh, gosh, what's his name? Jeffrey Wright. He was uh, – a lot of people are like, oh, Jeffrey Wright is the, the first um, African-American James Bond. I, I think actually Bernie Casey, technically, if you include Never Say Never Again in the, um, in the James Bond – uh, you know, universe. Even though most people don't, he is technically the original African American Felix yeah. Leiter. So it was pretty yeah, cool was really to cool. see and that in cool. there. Just like, um, yeah, that he didn't play the role like, oh, well, I'm going to play Felix the way Felix has always been played. He just sort of played him more as a friend, which is kind of what Felix is meant to be. Um, he played him as a right. friend of Bond's, and they had a couple of humorous scenes. A bit where they're jogging in their um, their boxer shorts to avoid uh, suspicion. He's uh-huh. goofy and stupid, but it's mm-hmm. also a really good, scene, like like fun little moment between uh, Sean Connery and and Bernie. Like added yeah, some yeah, like, for sure. actual chemistry to the movie. It's a shame there's no chemistry between Sean Connery and uh, Kim Bassinger, but at least there's some chemistry <laughs> in the movie, which is nice. <laughs> right, right. That's hey, yeah. That's one thing you can say. He had a uh, he had better <laughs> chemistry than um, he did with uh, Kim Bassinger. <laughs> yes, um, but yet yeah, very, very, very sad. Our thoughts and prayers go out to the uh, the Casey. Absolutely. Family. All right. So moving on to Q Branch, and we've got one thing one. in here <laughs> to talk about in in Q Branch. And once again, for those of you who don't know, Q Branch is where we talk about things outside of the main movies and news and stuff like that. Talk about books, comics, and weird little instances yeah. like this. So <laughs> this is a this is very interesting. It's actually more of a story, Ooh. I want to say, than it is really like a um. Yeah, uh, uh, you know, a, a topic to discuss is just like this this weird little instance I'm ready for that time, um, Griffin. I'm ready. That came up. <laughs> yeah, oh. Yes, story Light time. Us. Are you ready? Uh, I gotta plug my uh-huh. computer in here because it's uh-huh. dying. Ah, oh, there we go. Okay, <laughs> should have had that plugged in in the beginning. Anyways, so. In a new biography by Dylan Jones, I, he's writing a biography on Davey Bo, David Bowie, and it's called David Bowie, A Life. <laughs> <laughs> great, great title there. Um, there's an interesting tale of when David Bowie befriended Roger Moore. So sometime in the 1970s, Bowie moved to Switzerland to avoid the oppressive tax regime of the UK at the time, despite not knowing anyone in the country. But 007 was just down the road. Oscar-nominated scriptwriter and novelist Hanif uh, Qureshi provided his anecdote for the book. So, one day, about half past five in the afternoon, there is a knock on the door, and there he was. Hello, David. (laughs) Roger Moore comes in, and they had a cup of tea. He stays for drinks and then dinner and tells lots of stories about the James Bond films. They had a fantastic night, uh, fantastic time, a brilliant night. 
So, but then <laughs> the next day at good old five thirty, <laughs> knock knock, it's Roger Moore. He invites himself in and sits down. Yeah, I'll have a gin and tonic, David. He tells the same stories, but they're slightly less entertaining <laughs> the second time around. After two weeks of more turning up at 5.25 p.m. literally every day, David Bowie could be found underneath the kitchen table pretending not to be in. So this is very interesting because Bowie was later offered the role of Max Zorin for 1985's A View to a Kill, but obviously turned it down because that role was uh, given to Christopher Very Walken. interesting. So, <laughs> Sir Roger Moore's official Twitter has disputed the validity of the story, calling it not true at all. But if this is true, this is absolutely <laughs> hysterical. Roger Moore comes in, grabs his drink, his gin and tonic. He's like, oh, let me tell you about the time I was James oh Bond. God. And he just keeps repeating the same stories over and over again. This is gold. Oh I don't know whether it's true or not, but even if, if there is the slightest inkling of truth in this, I think this is absolutely hysterical. Oh um, And, you know, it's something that I feel I could see Roger Moore doing, <laughs> right? I feel like I don't know. It, it, it's interesting. It sounds like something an older Roger Moore would do. Um. Right, well, you got to think this is. I, I don't know what Bond film they were filming while he was in Switzerland, but if this was right around the time of A View to a Kill, he's this definitely is the up 70s, there so in age. Like so a little, a little younger. This is like probably. I'm, I'm imagining Spy Who Loved Me age, like you know, mid forties, fifties. I guess okay, so he's probably like peak peak more, peak more. yeah. So I, I don't know. It's right. I, I want to believe it's true just because it's really funny. Um, but I mean, <laughs> yeah. I can also see it yeah. being a little damaging to uh, Roger Moore because it makes Roger Moore sound. It doesn't go with his his general, uh, I guess, persona of like the cool guy, you know, the cool guy constantly. Maybe maybe he was maybe he was yeah. That's that's true. With, that's true. Uh, David Bowie, which would be an interesting uh, phenomenon. Right. And I I mean, I feel like there's probably some exaggeration in there. Like every day, he probably did not show up oh, every day, but yeah. he may have showed up multiple <laughs> times, told similar ish stories. Because, I mean, you got to think uh, James Bond was yeah. his life. I mean, that it really was. So it's like, you know, what, what does he have to talk about <laughs> other than, you know, uh, politics and James Bond, right? <laughs> Naturally. Uh, yeah, no, right. that's. Um, oh, my God. I, they're just, I, I can imagine the awkwardness. Of um, being offered uh, oh, yeah. Max Zorin if yeah. this had happened, uh, like ten years later, then suddenly you think you're done, and then Roger Moore is right there at your doorstep again with, with the James Bond, uh, <laughs> the James Bond movie <laughs> offer. Oh boy, that is oh, that is so um, hilarious. And the thing that he may he may have turned down the role purely because he just didn't want to be around Roger Moore. Um, I know. I, I think that that is even that more is absolutely funny. hysterical. Um, yeah. Well, if, if, and if it's true that the role was actually offered to him, it makes sense why he would turn right, it down. Yeah. <laughs> it, it is just, um, it also, I mean, it, 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 I think it is pretty fairly common knowledge that he was offered the role. Um, Cause I think it's why Christopher uh, Walken played it the way he did. Um, you were, right. But, right. I mean, it's just, oh my god! I I I, I don't see this as being like I, I can see why they've had to refute it. Uh, I don't see it as being a bad story. I see this as being kind of charming, kind no. of like like um, I don't know, a little a little lame, but kind of cool. Like it's like I don't know, it's kind of cute. <laughs> you know, it it's just one of those things where it they might try and spin it as some sort of defamation right. type thing. But it's real. I mean, it's really not. It's an awkward encounter that happened to two icons uh, in their respective industries. Like you know, like it's just- and, yeah, it's just you know, it's just like fun little banter, a weird instance that happened. I'm sure David Bowie didn't wish ill will on Roger Moore because he kept I, showing oh up God. and <laughs> telling the same a, uh, stories. It was just one of those things. <laughs> I, want Wait, I want a. I want a, a a small little indie film made about this called like like um, my summer with Bowie or something. Honestly, uh, someone <laughs> probably will make it into like something. one more drink or something like that. With it spelled like more, I guess I'm Roger Moore. That would be. Oh my god! One would, more drink. <laughs> oh please! This is the perfect short film. You're you're giving someone Absolutely. gold if here. No one else if you are a do it, filmmaker, I'll do it. I'll find this a, is just... uh, Roger Moore lookalike, and I'll. Uh, 
<laughs> yeah, you do it. Well, it doesn't even have to be a Roger Moore lookalike. I mean, just look at the George true. Lazenby documentary. That guy didn't Very look true. Like Actually, Lazenby. yeah, this is, I would love to see the guys who made uh, Becoming Bond do this because I feel like <laughs> that, that Wes Anderson style is perfect for something yeah. like this. <laughs> it, it would be. Oh, I, I I completely that yes that is what I want to see those guys make this yes if you if the filmmakers of Becoming Bond are listening to this by project. chance please yeah. make this Roger Moore or David Bowie <laughs> short film it becomes the new oh Frost my Nixon <laughs> <laughs> a little different but yeah oh my gosh Bowie Moore yes yeah, so uh we're Wherever you are listening to this episode, let us know in the comments section of wherever it is what you think of this little encounter, because I'm very curious as to how you're spinning it. Uh, is this a thing that looks kind of bad on Roger Moore? Is it just a funny encounter? Do you think it's not a huge issue at all and it was just something kind of, I don't know, silly that happened? Uh, l- let me know, Let us know all your thoughts and opinions in whatever comments section yes. you're at. And like I said, that was the only thing we had for Q Branch this week, so moving right right along here into brother Excellent. from Langley. Now, we're going to try and make this uh this next segment as as quick as we can. Um but, you know, it, it, we we do have a little bit to to yes, discuss yes, here. Yes, we do. And it really all revolves around Kingsman the Golden Circle. So, we're basically just going to be giving you our quick review of the film, um some of the bondisms that we found throughout uh, the movie and, and then ultimately you know where the franchise can go from here what other uh, things can they take out of the yes, bond tool belt yeah. a whole bunch of stuff like that excuse me and uh, just so you are uh, just, just so you know we will be discussing spoilers so the movie has been out for almost a week now um, so a naturally we're going to discuss it in more depth right, yeah. than what we were able to do in our initial review which if you want to hear our initial thoughts you can go to the men versus movies youtube channel check out our review there yeah uh i i think it's no surprise if you've looked at our twitter feed or, or anything we we both really like this yes movie. That, that definitely not made any bones about I, that I, like <laughs> yeah I, I would say we we actually loved this movie. So with, without further ado, we're going going to be getting into this. Uh, like I said, spoilers ahead. So be weary. Uh, you can skip ahead to the next section of shaken butt heard. All right, let's do this. <laughs> let's talk Kingsman two. So um, let's just get let's just get the major spoiler yes. out of the way. The death of Merlin. Yeah, that was actually surprisingly Man. heavy. Yeah, that is. That it was one hell of a way to um <laughs> to send out a character. Yeah, no kidding. Holy shit! With like the 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 John Denver um uh country roads playing. That was with like the orchestral yeah. version yeah. of it, which I really liked, and uh, Mark Strong singing. Oh on. my god! That was. It's, I know. I it's cry, that's like dude. so so sentimental, emotional, but I couldn't see it being in any other kind of movie because it's it's just so goofy. <laughs> like it, it like, yeah. like he sang yeah. country roads. And then detonated himself, <laughs> killing the henchman. Absolutely insane. But it was so brilliant. Oh my god. <laughs> I, well, when you put it like that, it takes all of the emotionality out of it and it becomes some ridiculous just right, thing. Yeah, yeah. Like, and I think it's like the no. beauty of these films. It's like they, no. they shouldn't be as sentimental as they are. But there is a lot of heart in them, even yes, like the yes, stuff with exactly. Harry. Was surprisingly emotional uh, when it could have been played right. off as like, a, like, yeah, a, like a, it was. an it really was. trope, and it was to an extent. But mm-hmm. um, it was, it was they, 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 their relationship is so believable. Eggsy and um, and Harry Hart's relationship is so believable in a weird way that yeah, they, you, they just they furthered it. They they already they I'm sorry they expanded upon what they had already established right. in the first one, which is and that an was interesting just, thing to say great. about this movie because it basically kills everyone from the first movie. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, exactly. Which some people didn't like. Some people were like, oh, they just killed off everyone from the first one except for Merlin. Then they bring back Harry, but then they kill Merlin. And then some people were like, well, where are the stakes in this? And I, I have to disagree because I, I think that the stakes are, are very well realized yeah. throughout this movie. Um, And, and re- you know, regardless of what your your thoughts are on them bringing back Harry, they brought him back. You can't have Kingsman without Colin Firth. Yeah. Let's just oh be honest God. here. Um, <laughs> Right. 
Well, and then the other side of this is people are like, oh, well, they can just bring back whoever they want now. Mm, when you go out the way that Merlin did, I don't think that there's any coming back from that. No, that yeah. was just so well executed, and it was the perfect send-off. If you were to bring him back, it would almost be a disservice right, to Right, yeah, character. and that's the thing. I think um, the difference is Harry died to up the stakes and to force Eggsy, like from a narrative level, force an Eggsy into uh, the hero role. Whereas, right. so his death, it, it's of a narrative purpose, but it was, and it was like shocking, but it wasn't like, like, you know what I mean? It wasn't necessary. Um, and that's almost what, mm-hmm. what made it so mm-hmm. brutal is it was so unnecessary. Um, right. Whereas Merlin's death, Merlin's death was thematic in a sense, and it also was emotionally resonant and it ha- it happened. It did help them further the story along, but it was in a very sort of a roundabout way. It was more about the, the, the right, emotions right. of the characters. So yeah, bringing him back would cheapen that emotion. Whereas bringing Harry back, I didn't feel like cheapened the first film in any way. Um, and, and in fact, yeah. it enhances this film because God, I love Colin Firth so much. It's like unbelievable. Yeah. He's just, he's so good. <laughs> oh my gosh. Um, but anyways, okay. So we, we've kind of just talked about the major right, spoiler yes, there just, just to kind of get it out of the way. But uh, let me, let me just get your thoughts on the, on the film as a whole, because I, I did the yes, review yes, on yes, our yes. channel, which you can go yeah. watch, by the way. Uh-huh. Another plug. Uh, so I, I let me, let's let's hear your thoughts on on uh, Kingsman: The Golden Circle. Just the overall um, impressions uh, on absolutely it. balls to the wall. It is it is a film that it's it's hard to recommend because it is so out there. Um, unless you've seen it, because it is and it mm-hmm. is slightly different from the first one. Um, it doesn't have like that uh, almost a young adult like sort of aspect to it because they have like the training and all that stuff. And that's all gone. Right, it's just right. purely a, like, you know, James Bond spy caper this time around. And I loved it for that. It, it is. And we've, we've said this before. Um, it is. Oh yeah. Moonraker to the secret services. Spy who loved me. <laughs> like it's, a, and I mean yep. that in a good way. Yep. And I mean it, that in a good way because exactly. it's a, a pastiche. So if you didn't like Moonraker, don't worry. It is not like unenjoyable. It is just so much more ridiculous than the first entry. Um, right. Well, and the thing that helps this movie along is that the first movie was already ridiculous right, yeah. enough and, and already was Moonraker-esque <laughs> enough so that when they go to this, you're like, all right, it I already know what I'm in the for. You know, we, we didn't yeah. have, like... Exactly. We didn't have all the Connery films. We didn't have Live or Let Die. We didn't have Honor Majesty's Secret Service. You know, we right, yeah. <laughs> we had uh, this ridiculous balls of the wall, uh, James Bond inspired spy flick. And then the sequel is just ramping it up. They oh, dial it yeah. up to 11. And uh, surprisingly, even though there's a lot of craziness going on here, they make it work and they make it almost a little bit more emotional than the first one. I dare so, I yeah, say, sure. I, I I, I felt I felt the stakes were pretty heavy here, especially for Eggsy because uh, obviously Roxy dies, his dog dies, one of his best friends is killed, uh, but from um, uh, Ju- Julianne Moore yes. when they blow up his house, um, and then he's got to reconcile with the fact that you know his his <laughs> girlfriend Princess Tildy from the first one, which is hilarious, incredible yeah. that they brought her back. So so glad that they actually and turned almost, that into it, a relationship. It almost like sort of illustrates um, how how not Bond like Eggsy is because he, he right. He, which while while the whole movie is being Bond like, it's like the central character is so right, not James yeah. Bond. While the rest even, of the movie um, is even is, Colin uh, Firth, he's the lepidopterus or whatever. However, say that word. Um, right. He, he, when, when he's not the James Bond persona, he's a very not James Bond character. Like he's the he's the dorky like yes. butterfly guy. It's just so right. It's, it's all very, very ironic. Very, very fun. Like sort of dissection of that. Yeah. Um, yeah, I and mean, it's just and you, you mentioned um, uh, Julianne Moore. I just want to say, like, I I know you didn't feel as uh, you didn't like her as much as I did. I oh, I absolutely mm-hmm. loved Poppy. With first of all, uh, how great we got like a um, we're not going to get these into the James Bond movies anymore. We got a pun name for the for the villain like Goldfinger or you know what I mean. Like we got Poppy as mm-hmm. in she's a drug dealer. <laughs> like that was fantastic. Yeah. Uh, yeah, everything right. about her was I mean, ridiculous. It was, it, that that right there was very Bond, yes. very well done. Mm-hmm. Um, I felt almost like it yeah. could have been in an Austin Powers movie, like you know, Poppy Adams. Could, oh, yeah, what, definitely. <laughs> there's a, there's actually a lot of stuff in this film that could have been Austin <laughs> Powers ish. 
It was like right. It was riding that line. You know, is Austin Powers esque. <laughs> oh my god! Oh my god! That was hands down one of the funniest hands parts down. of the movie. <laughs> it was also very Roger Moore. Yes. The way that you know they filmed, like the camera was going down her body, but then they like went further than what they would cut off right, in the Roger Moore yeah. movies. Oh my god! <laughs> so it was just that was a nice little uh, nod there to how more there were so many would, little uh, like I, I, I wasn't ex- I didn't expect so many nods and I didn't notice as many the first viewing but I, I saw I've seen it twice already and mm. um, the second viewing I noticed a lot more like James Bond isms and like I, mean, I did the too. obvious nods yeah. like there's the underwater yeah. car and all this sort of stuff uh, the Alpine like sort of right which is funny because we're calling this the Moonraker to the first one which was apparently the spy who loved me but there was no underwater right. car yeah, there yeah, was yeah. underwater and then the, the, anyways and this you was know. great because like they, even like they had like the little um, the rotating gondola which reminded me of the the um, the G-Force machine from Moonraker <laughs> yes. and <laughs> yes, <laughs> it's like, and yes. Like, uh, oh like my god people at the at the um at the retirement village at the bottom of the mountain reminded me of something from, you know, you know, the guy in all the Roger Moore movies, who's like drinking his bottle of wine and he like double takes like, yeah. it reminded me of that, like the random <laughs> civilians. Witnessing. That was like the, um, <laughs> yeah, yeah, it was, it was pretty much like the, the guy drinking the wine while he, he's riding <laughs> through the gondola, uh, uh car basically like, uh-huh. you know, from Moonraker. So I mean, it was once again, just more nods oh, yeah. to I Moonraker. Mean, just, in this movie. Like, yeah. It, it, then they had like the whole, um, and this may not have been a deliberate nod, but it, it, it definitely struck me as being um, Roger Moore esque, which was um, the president in this movie. Well, um, there was no, uh, oh I guess, <laughs> villainous president in um, any of the uh, the James Bond films. I didn't think it was really like mm-hmm. I think uh, Bruce Greenwood's like sort of George W. Bush Trump esque president. Um, Reminded me mm-hmm. a lot of at the end of Fear Eyes Only when they have like that, that weird Margaret Thatcher like bit. <laughs> like, oh <my laughs> just like God. never explicitly it's never explicitly yeah, said yeah. it's Margaret Thatcher, but it's very obviously Margaret Thatcher, and they just like like just making right, right. absolute fun of her. Uh and then that kinda of reminded me of that. Mm-hmm. Like it just in a weird way. I don't think that was a deliberate reference, but it definitely it was in the in the vein of that, which Absolutely hysterical. Yeah, I remember yeah, watching the movie yeah. and I was like, oh, they had Obama in the first one and they're not going to have Trump in this one. But then he turned out to be a more integral character in the movie. So it makes sense that he was sort of like a. <laughs> yeah, right. Yeah, it was just like he actually had a speaking role. He wasn't just like some animated. Yeah. Oh, yeah, head. I know. That was. Oh, my God. But. Oh, I'm just. Like, like, there's just so many. Like, and then. All the stuff with the with Elton John. Elton John had such a large presence oh, in this movie God. that I was not expecting. I was and, not expecting um, that at it all. It almost makes you wish yeah. we got an Elton John like theme song. <laughs> that would have been so good. Right, the, right. I know. I was kind of like when when Eggsy had the car going down underwater. I was like almost expecting there to be Same, like an opus- yeah. opening title <laughs> like song. You know, but even even that whole opening oh, scene gosh. was like a Bond movie. Where, like with the, the cold open with the an action scene. Yeah, yeah, I the cold lo- open, also loved, definitely. I also very, loved how Charlie bond. was the henchman with his big robot arm, which like a bit like um, uh, Tee Hee yep. from Live and Let Die. Um, that was yeah, yep. just just so many yep. little great nuggets. And I feel like if you haven't, if you haven't, if you've only seen it once and you did notice a couple of little bond things, go back. Like maybe wait for it to come out on uh, home release if you don't want to go to the theater again. But um, although you mm-hmm. should, because I want a third one of these. <laughs> Oh God! I well, they're already oh, working on God. it. They're already but, uh, working on yeah, a script. No, just, I'm pretty it, sure. It, it, so, I feel like these yeah. movies are great. In the same way, the Austin Powers movies are great as like a drinking game, where you just sort of take a shot every time they do like a like a Bond thing, and you would die, but yeah. it would be so yeah. much fun. <laughs> right, right. Now you'll oh, live and let die. We should have, we should have a, <laughs> oh, uh, another segment to this podcast where it's just us drinking, and it's called Live and Let Die. Called yeah, live and let die. We just die of like liver poisoning. <laughs> that can be. Um, be all, <laughs> yeah, that can be a be supplemental 100th, show. One uh, hundredth episode special. <laughs> yes. Oh my god, that that's great. Um, I, I quickly just want to go back to the Julianne oh, yes. Moore thing because yeah, yeah. uh, you're right. I I wasn't as much of a fan of her as you were, but mm-hmm. um. On, on on repeat viewing, on the second viewing, I actually didn't mind her as much, maybe because I knew what I was getting into, but uh, there were parts to her that just kind of reminded me of, like, like she she seemed like she would be the villain in a Robert Rodriguez film, namely, like, a Spy Kids oh movie, <laughs> um, which is very true, but, like, I don't know, I, I, like I said, the second time around, 
she <laughs> wasn't as over the top. Once again, probably because I knew what I was getting into. Yes, but, yeah, uh, yeah. Just, just throwing that out there. But um, interesting, you mentioned the. Um, oh my god, I can't believe we haven't talked about oh, this. Yeah, go ahead. I was gonna say we haven't talked about this. The 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 statesman. Oh my god, we got yes. we got to touch on the statesman because Brilliant. they were awesome. <laughs> uh, Pedro Pascal's agent whiskey was fantastic. Oh my god, and his little turn at the end was like it worked. It um mm-hmm. it didn't it didn't come across as yeah. cheap. Yeah, which it could have. Um, like looking back on it, it's like that could have come across really really lame and cheap and like underdeveloped. And while it's not like the mm-hmm. most developed thing in the movie, um, it. It feels natural, it and it also it, it, it justifies the Kingsman being uh, so the Statesman being as prominent in the film as they are, uh, which yeah. I think is the most yeah, important part because otherwise they're just they're just randomly world building for the sake of it, which um, yeah right um, right right no but I, I I think on the whole just the Statesman were really enjoyable all the performances yep. across the board were great um you know Halle Berry was a nice compliment to Mark Strong yeah, Merlin I don't like, I don't like very her. much like the cute. I don't like her very much generally I definitely don't like her in Dying of the Day but um but she's oh, really God, good in yeah. this and it's almost like I wonder yeah, if they're gonna is. make this the um they're gonna make her Statesman persona a little jinx like in the next one that'll be interesting she's getting her oh, jinx spinoff I film. <laughs> Oh my god! Imagine I wish her, I wish her um, code name had been Jin because that's pretty close to Jinx. Oh, that would have been great, right? But here's the thing: her name, her code name was Ginger Ale because she wasn't hard enough to Ooh, be an agent. True. That does thematically work, I guess. Uh-huh. <laughs> thematically right. Um, but yeah, it was just. I mean, I don't know. The, the, the Statesman. There wasn't really anything we could compare that to in the James Bond um, mythology. Sheriff Obviously, J. W. the Pepper? CIA would be the closest thing. <laughs> Oh, As well, an American stereotype, like maybe. the, like the yee haw, like kind of yeah, you hauling ass through my parish. Oh yeah. god, oh my god, <laughs> yes, be... yeah. Well, well that probably be the closest <laughs> thing we could do because there wasn't really any Felix character no, in no, this. No, no, no. And I mean, I feel movie. like that would have been a bit disappointing if they had a Felix character because Felix is pretty much just a normal guy. <laughs> so yeah, he's just he's just a CIA agent. They don't they don't need you know yeah. It, <laughs> it doesn't matter. But um but yeah, just uh, to wrap up this this quick little, you know, spoiler discussion mm-hmm. on Kingsman 2. Uh Brody, what are you what are your concluding thoughts? Um how would you rate the movie out of 10 and then what do you want um, out of the sequel? I my concluding thoughts are this is exactly where I wanted this franchise to go. Um I think if you're worried about like the div- I mean, if you're worried about if you haven't seen it yet, we just ruined most of the movie, but it's still it'll still be fun to watch because it's not it's not one of those yeah. Which why why the hell are you right, listening like, to this? I mean that's like your own choice, man. Do whatever you want. But um, it's all it is one of those right, movies yeah. you probably see knowing everything, and it's still fun. It's not like a it's not a movie built around its plot twists, but there are there they are there and they are fun. Um, I think this yeah, is just yeah. yeah. This is exactly what I wanted from a Kingsman sequel. It takes all the elements I really like and it ramps them up and it gets more ridiculous and it gets more fun. Um. I, I cannot wait for a third one. I think I give this a. I think I give this an eight because it 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 knows what it wants to be, and I know that like everyone yeah everyone I'm says right, like right oh you. like you know that's not an excuse for for um for bad filmmaking, but I don't think this is bad filmmaking. I think this is um this is no. filmmaking that is very deliberately doing um parody, and I. Much in the same way that the Fast and right. Furious movies. Now, do. I went on a rant about this when we were uh, t- when we were talking about this after uh, the screening. But yeah, yeah. In, this, in much the same way that the Fast and the Furious movies are dumb, but like they're aware of it. This is this is very over the top mm-hmm. and ridiculous, but it's aware of it, and it's almost it's the feature, not the bug. So um, if you if you're a bit worried about like the middling reviews, I think the middling reviews come from people not fully understanding. Mm what the director was going for with these movies. And they were, spe- they were expecting a little more like, I don't know what they were expecting to be honest, but, um, yeah, I don't, I don't either. Cause this is exactly right. what I, I'm just real quickly. I'm yeah, going to yeah, echo yeah. what you said. This is exactly what I was expecting out I mean, of a Kingsman yeah. sequel. It's exactly what I <laughs> wanted out of a Kingsman sequel. I mean, it was, over the top, they expanded the mythology. They brought in the statesmen. They went to different locations across the world. They had uh, more more moving parts in the uh, the action mm-hmm. set pieces. Um, great character development. I will say there were a lot of uh, subplots yes, there going are, yes. on. And while I thought they all concluded pretty nicely, they they left some to be uh, continued in. They, they left some open to be continued in um, in uh, later films. But overall, I just 
the stakes were there. Uh, they uh, developed the characters even more so than they had already done in the first one. Just all around a really... F- this is probably the most fun I've had in, in the theaters all year. I'm going to be honest I think with I you. Would agree and with I just, yeah, I, mean, I loved the movie. I think this is like... I had a ton of fun with... Uh, in a similar sense, I had a ton of fun with like Triple X. But that was objectively a bad <laughs> oh movie. Um, yeah, that is, that is, is a bad is, movie. All of the things I enjoyed about... Triple X, the experience of watching Triple X, because they just don't make movies like that anymore. Um, but like mm-hmm. with a very enjoyable, appealing film to like sort of rest it in. So it's in right. every way better than that, something like that. But it is a similar experience in that. Oh my god, far yeah, superior. It, but it's a similar yeah. experience in that I had a ton of fun. And it was just, it was just, I switched my brain off a little bit. There are some things to think about in this movie. They do like tackle the drug war in a very interesting way. Um, yeah, I wasn't well, expecting that. Either, but um, <laughs> they do like tackle actual real world issues, but it's in a fun way that it's sort of like I don't have to think about this, and it doesn't want me to think about this. Yeah, um, you yeah. know, it, it almost makes fun of movies who want you to think about that sort of thing. It's 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 pure escapism, and I loved it. I loved it so much, and I want the next one to be even more absurd. I want him to go to space. I want him to just like just yeah, fall to just, the wall, like madness. Right. <laughs> Same. Same, same. I just want them to continue the story. If the third one is going to be the last one, I want them to conclude it well. I want this trilogy. I want the mm. Blu-ray box set. You name it. Like this is this is probably one of my my favorite trilogy. If, if they do go ahead and make the third one, and the third one ends up being as good, this has potential to be one of my favorite trilogies of like oh, the past. Yeah, time. absolutely. It's- um, it really, really is that enjoyable to me, and especially as like like a Bond fan for us, this is a nice supplement to. Uh, yeah, James I mean, Bond. I was it really going is. into this. I was so psyched. It's done in yeah, the same way. I, I was so psyched. I was, it was, it was almost like going to see a new Bond movie in the level, in terms of the level it really of like is. Yeah. anticipation I had. Like that, that sort of like, I want to see what the villain is. I want to see what the henchman is. I want to see where they go. I want to see like this. I don't know where the plot yeah. is. Like that, that kind of like visceral surface level enjoyment that I had watching the James Bond films as a kid, like get rifling through these VHSs. Like what, what's going to happen in this one? I had that same mm-hmm. level of like joy. Just and I, and I have the same level of joy looking forward to the next one. And that's something that the James Bond films don't necessarily do as much anymore, but I do like where they've gone. Um, and so it is nice to have my cake and eat it too in that sense. I get to have that childlike joy and I get to enjoy my <laughs> sophisticated James yeah. Bond films. So, yeah. Yeah, that's it, a good point. Good that's a good point. Um, yeah, so just to, to push, I'm going to push you at an eight as well. I was thinking eight and a half, but I think eight's a fair yeah, score for this movie. All right, so that is going to do it for, for uh, Brother from Langley. We've got one more segment for you guys. Thanks for hanging in there. I know for those of you who haven't seen Kingsman 2, that was a little bit of a a little bit of a chunk there yes. to skip through. But anyways, moving on to Shaken But Heard. We're going back to the topic that we started the entire show off with today. That is the director for uh, a Bond film, I guess. We're going to be, you know, Denis Villeneuve it was in, is apparently, you know, Daniel Craig's choice to direct the uh, his final chapter in the Bond series. So we thought it'd be a good idea to com- uh, compile a list of the top five directors we'd like to see tackle a Bond film. And now I, I could have sworn that we did this all already during our first episode but i went back and re-listened to it and <laughs> we, we did, did not. not um we 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 ranked sean connery's uh films which we want to see if you want to listen to that you can go check out the first episode Be of the show man. but <laughs> yes <laughs> um so we've got we we both have five picks i don't think we have any honorable mentions because it was a little tough a, for us to couple. narrow down five yes oh I do. you do Okay, well, I'm gonna. Good thing I was gonna let you start, <laughs> anyways. So, Brody, give us your honorable mentions as to the, the the five directors you'd like to see tackle a Bond film because it's, you know, it's an interesting thing because going into the next Bond movie, I think the first thing we all think of isn't necessarily who's going to direct it. At least no, for I would me, agree. yeah, I mean, you know, that's a recent because, thing. Yeah, I I think the ta- right. It, it's it's only been a recent thing where it's like the talent of the director has been hyped up with the Bond films. That's mainly because they, they they got Sam Mendes on, but um, yeah, you know, Martin Campbell who who did Casino Royale. I wasn't necesarily familiar with his work. I mean, I knew he did Goldeneye, right, yeah. but like I. You know Martin Campbell. Okay, so he's he's a pretty solid director. Let's see what he does with the movie. Um, so it, it's an interesting thing that it's just in in recent, you know, times it's it's really been like, oh, who's directing the next Bond film? This is a huge yeah. huge thing. So, uh, anyways, uh, what are your honorable mentions, and then uh, I'll let you give your number. Well, five. I would say um, I, I have just just some random names. I'm not going to talk too much about them. 
Um, I have Jan Demange on my honorable mentions because I feel like if if it's true what they're saying about his pitch, I would love to see him inject that passion into a Bond film eventually. If not the yeah. next one, one down the Actually, track. Actually, I'll I'll, uh, I'll put I'll push you on that yeah. one. I, I would throw in Jan Demange as an honorable. And then mentions, um, in, yeah. in the same vein, I think um, someone like Danny Boyle would be really interesting. Um, I know you have like okay. mixed feelings on him. I think he is um, a standout director, no matter what the, the the material he's working on, like the quality of the material he's working on. Uh, right. I think he is a very interesting, visually uh, like visually interesting director, but not like so far like down the path that it's like, oh, this doesn't feel like a, a Bond film anymore. So I think he does still have that that classical sensibility right. that um, I think is necessary for a Bond film. Well, he 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 would bring a uh, you know inherently British <laughs> right, yeah, style to I, it, which I think I, would I like be that trend cool. of having. And British like I said, I mean, like I think that's pretty cool. <laughs> like, um. right, right, yeah. I mean, I you you know, it's not that I don't like Danny Boyle. I, I I'm not a fan of some of it. I like I don't really care for the two Train Spotting movies. I think you know they're uh-huh. fine. It's just not my cup of tea. Um, and his style is well, it's very high energy. Um, very um, it's it's his own. Yeah. You know, and I. It's not that I don't like him. It's just like I there is probably a lot of other directors that I prefer. But I, you know, I agree with you. I think he he has the the makings in him to make a oh, good sure. Bond film. I definitely wouldn't take yeah. that off the table. I mean, Steve Jobs, probably my favorite film from him, um, was one of my favorite movies yeah. the year it came out. Or and then the, the last on so. my honorable mentions is someone we just you just mentioned, uh, Martin Campbell. If you're rebooting Bond again, he's done it twice. Um, <laughs> just have, have him I mean, do like, it. I mean, his just stuff outside of Bond it. is eh, like Green Lantern was dreadful. Yeah, um, yeah, and uh, Heart of Darkness or whatever it was called. That was okay. It was an okay thriller with uh, what's his face, um, Mel Gibson. Yeah, Mel Gibson. Uh, I I enjoyed it, but it wasn't like it didn't blow me away. But his Bond stuff is consistently very very good. Now, he's he's demonstrated an understanding for the character. Uh, and, and an ability to yeah. reinvent the character in multiple different ways. So I wouldn't mind seeing him just have a go at yeah. it, see what he's got cooking. Um, but I, it's not it's not someone sure. I'm like. Yeah, I, I know some people are like dead set. Like he has to do the next one after Craig leaves because he's he's done it two times. And I don't, no. I don't think that's the case. No. He's not like like that caliber of a talent in my eyes that he is like. For sure, the man. But I wouldn't complain. I, he definitely mm. has a familiarity with the with the series that it is valuable so yeah that's my three honorable right. mentions <laughs> okay yeah i mean you know solid choices not necessarily people other than yon demange who i think should be given a chance at a film probably later yes, down the yeah. road um you know yeah they're not bad picks <laughs> all right so uh what's your number five, five then? is a far far out of left like not, not out of left field it's just unlikely um i i would love to see david fincher <laughs> That's like, I think. Oh my god! Why you want that? You want that Trent Reznor and Atticus oh Ross my Bond god. score? Yeah, absolutely, that would be amazing. <laughs> that would be the least. <laughs> that would have been like that'd be like the least Bond score oh, that's ever be been so made. So cool! Oh my god! I think yeah, David Fincher be interesting. has a, a an aesthetic that I think definitely works for Daniel Craig's Bond. So if he did Bond twenty five, or even if he did a new Bond and they took it in, in even an even darker direction, um. I think mm-hmm. he would definitely. He definitely. I mean, he definitely has the chops for that. I don't think anyone's arguing that. Um, yeah, he does. But yeah, he's worked with Daniel Craig before, uh, with the girl with the dragon tattoo, and mm-hmm. I don't know. I just I, something about a David Fincher Bond film. Just it almost strikes. It, it really, it really captures it does, your interest. Yeah, I'll tell just, you what. You like. You hear David Fincher directing a Bond film. So you're like, oh wow, what yeah, are we he's getting so with atmospheric this? Atmospheric as a director, and yeah. I feel like. Um, one of the big things that people don't generally talk about, I mean, they do, but they don't like ever like uh, attribute this to the direction. The, a huge part of the Bond films is their locale and like the 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 mood that that location sort of provides. Um, and right. I can't think of anyone else in the in the business right now who does mood and like atmosphere better than him. So I just think that would be it would be such a such a rich like oh just tantalizing you know using my buzzwords here um sort of uh bond film go. i, I would just <laughs> i would just there. die it would be so great but i don't think he would ever do it i just it seems completely yeah i don't likely well i i wouldn't and never say you know i'll never say never i think he's a case where he could be 
he could be convinced. I, you know, it's a it's a good choice. I didn't actually think of okay. him for whatever reason, but you're right. He's he's got a lot of the atmospheric ness that I guess could make for an interesting interpretation of Bond. Mm-hmm. Not for um, sure. Yeah. But yeah, no, okay. What's, All right. All right. I can respect that. Okay. Um, my number five is someone who probably will never direct a Bond film, but my God, would I love to see it. I would <laughs> die if this man was announced as the, uh, the director of, uh, of a Bond film in the near future. Uh, Martin oh, Scorsese. Oh, wow. Did not expect that. That's interesting. Martin Scorsese, <laughs> he just, oh gosh, he's just, the way he directs his crime uh-huh. films, especially, I mean, you know, crime is different from espionage, but all the moving parts, that is um, a good point, the, yeah. uh, the way they're shot, the performances he can get out of his actors, there's a lot of stuff in there that you can be like, okay, now if you threw that into a Bond film, okay, I could see that, all right, I'm really digging this, and and, and the biggest thing with Martin Scorsese that I think he could, he would bring back to a Bond film, and not not to say the Craig films don't have this, but it's um you know less so than some of the previous ones is a sense of elegance and class. Oh, yeah. Um, not like I said, not to say Daniel Craig does the Craig films don't have that. They definitely do have it, but it's not as much in the forefront as yeah. older films. No, I get that. And it's you like know, a timelessness. I, There's a timelessness it, that to his direction. Yeah. Yes. Exactly, and that just you know has to do with the fact that he's <laughs> as old as he is, he's as talented as he is. He's one of those, um, yeah. Like I said, I don't think he'd right. I I mean, I don't think he'd ever do it. I mean, maybe if he was approached, but I I can't see Eon ever approaching him. I mean, for if he's that. producing a Joker movie, um, why but, not? <laughs> right. Well, he's also you know kind of a Warner Brothers. Maybe guy, they, maybe so. the rights go to Warner Brothers. Who who's to say? <laughs> yeah, maybe. Who knows? But anyways, uh, just I, I, Scorsese has the makings in him to make a phenomenal Bond film, one that would be, I, I think it's safe to say it'd be oh, pretty yeah. different, um, but not overly different. It would have a sense of class, elegance, maybe throwing a little nostalgia mm-hmm. in there. Um and I, I just, I just love to see what he'd be able to do with it. I, I really think he could just knock yeah. it out of the park. Ever since I was a little boy, I always wanted to be a super spy. Like I can, <laughs> <laughs> he, is, he just he remakes Goodfellas, but with like a Bond that would twist be on it. Hilarious. Yes. Um, okay, so my yes, yes. My number All right, four number is, four. Um, Alfonso Cuarón. I think. Yeah. Ooh, that is okay. You're picking some very out of yeah, the box think, choices think, here. <laughs> Makes my list feel very <laughs> trivial. I mean, he's got like um he'd done a franchise film before with Harry Potter. Um he's technically yeah. one of the most like meticulous directors working right now. Um like Children of Men, oh, Gravity, yeah. uh even Harry Potter, like and his, some of his other stuff. Um is just so finely crafted that I mean he's just a really, really breathtaking uh, directed a watch. Uh, I didn't love Gravity yeah, you're right. as a as a story, but I really really loved Gravity as a as a director's demo reel. Um, and mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. that's that's yeah, really what I mean, it is. And, and it yeah. works in that sense. I mean, a director's job is to also tell the story, and the story was fine. But he, he, there's only so much you could do with that story, I guess. Um, but Children of Men, mm-hmm. one of my favorite films. One oh, of my favorite films, and, so and he's so technically savvy and so good at. I don't know, just putting you into the story, um, whether it's just through the way he directs the scene or whether, like, even action scenes, like the famous uh, one-shot action scene from uh, Children of Men. Um, he is yep. just so, yeah, so, so technically savvy that I, I would love to see him do uh, a Bond film. I, think, I, I feel like I don't have to explain this too much. I feel like it, it makes sense when I say it. <laughs> no, I mean, his, the, the, name, the name speaks for itself. I'm actually glad you brought that up because the more you mention it, uh, yeah, he'd be a great choice, and and we'd get that Emmanuel Lebesky mm. cinematography, which would be so good, tasty, so delicious, so delicious. So delicious. Uh, <laughs> so delicious. <laughs> gonna, um, we have to do it once a show. We have to do it once a show. Elliot Carver. <laughs> yes. Um. But yeah, no. Yes. So I, I, that's that's my reasoning. I don't think I'm going to go into it anymore. Uh, Alfonso Cuarón would be no, no, amazing. I, <laughs> Yeah, in fact, he, you might, I might want to bump out Ooh. one of mine for him now that you mention it. Um, anyways, yeah, I wonder. Uh, <laughs> my number four, yeah, right. Oh, uh, my boy. number four is a very just generic yeah. kind of choice, but it's someone who could make a, I think he could make a great Bond film. Uh, it's Doug yes. Lyman. Yes, 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 yes. 
Donald mm-hmm. Lyman would be great, honestly. Like, look what he's... Okay, yeah, he did the first Bourne film, but you you brought this up. That was the least stereotypical Bourne film out of all of them that were made. This was before the Paul Greengrass shaky cam. The action scenes were incredibly well choreographed. He obviously has a knack for doing the spy kind of stuff. Yeah, um, for sure. And, you know, on top of that, he's just an incredibly talented talented director. I mean, the stuff I'm hearing from American Maid is really promising. Um, Edge of Tomorrow was fantastic. Yeah. Probably the most underrated film of that year when, when it came out. Um, the only thing is Tom Cruise would have to play James Bond in order for us to really get something oh, good. God. <laughs> and I, I don't think we're ready for that. No. Um, but just on top of that, you you know, he's just you look through his filmography and he's just got a lot of really solid films. Nothing that's just nothing that's like mind blowing, but just a, a lot of really quality, entertaining, uh, solid action packed films, which I, I think if you're looking for someone to direct a Bond film, those are kind of boxes you want to check off there. Um, and, and I think he could have a, a similar, uh, um, do a similar thing that Martin Campbell did. Whereas, you know, Martin Campbell, he's pretty, you know, just, he's a regular director, you know, whatever. <laughs> um, and, and, you know, he makes really solid Bond films. But I, I think Doug Lyman's got a little bit of a better, uh, you know, repertoire of yeah, movies, no, if sure. you will, uh, under his belt. So I, I'd like to see what he'd be able to do. Very, you know, very safe, very just generic choice, but. I I think Doug Lyman could could give us a very yeah, solid. Yeah, no, for sure. Movie. I think I mean this. I I wasn't actually putting mine in any particular order because uh, my number three is Doug Lyman as well. Um, yeah. Oh, is it really? Okay. See, mine is actually oh, ordered. Yeah, well, I, mean, so. it, I mean, it's kind of ordered. I, I think I was ordering it more in terms of. Um, I had a lot of. I had a couple of different criteria, and one was likelihood. <laughs> and I feel like Doug Lyman is definitely more. Mm. Definitely oh, more okay. That's a good point. Someone like Alfonso Cuarón or especially David Fincher. Um, so I had him. He got oh, a boost yeah. out of that. I feel like I would prefer to see Alfonso Cuarón, but Doug Lyman feels more likely. And yeah, it, it just it feels it right. right. And you yeah, know what I'm saying? Tomorrow is definitely. Um, I haven't seen American Made yet, but I'm hearing really good things. And it does seem like it's in mm-hmm. that genre where it would it, it could easily transition into a Bond film. Um, well, and didn't he? Uh, didn't he do Mr. and Mrs. Did Smith? He? he might have actually. I honestly I can't remember. I for whatever reason I am just recalling this i'm like he did mr and mrs if in that case, is the case and that's another James, selling point yeah he did to, do that oh my god yeah he's been doing fun like, he's been doing yeah. spy films for like the longest time so yeah. he, he already has like a knack for spy mm-hmm. films like and, i'm and saying like, too so like this is almost i could almost right, see him taking right. this in it like say like the next film tries to go more of a kingsman route and go old school i could see mr and mrs smith being getting the director of mrs and mrs smith to be uh the director for it being a logical thing to do, I guess, if you were going in that direction. Um, but even if you went into serious direction, right? Yeah, he's yeah, I agree. Himself. I have nothing much else to add to him uh, because you covered most of my thoughts. No, right? But, he's um, just, yeah, it's yeah. he's just a really competent director. Yeah, borderline. It, the film might be a little generic compared to some of the more recent ones, but mm-hmm. I feel like with the guiding hand of the broccolis, um, that probably wouldn't happen. So. Yeah, you know, just really solid, really action packed, a lot of fun. It would be, I, I think it would just be a very so entertaining too, yeah, movie. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. Okay, so That's that correct. was your number yes. three, correct? Okay, my number three is <gasps> Tim Burton. No, I'm kidding. I, I am completely joking. There, I, that was a fucking <laughs> awful, awful choice. No, my number three is uh, the man who directed Kingsman, hey, Matthew hey, Vaughn. Hey. Why not? Hey. You know, he, if they're looking to go a little bit lighter uh, on the tone, <laughs> bring back the nostalgia from the the older Bond films, because Kingsman seems to be killing it mm-hmm. in that department. Get the director of the man who's literally making the spiritual sequels <laughs> to those movies and have him make a Bond film. He's British. He's got a very British style, high energy, a yeah. lot of fun. He's a very quality director, too. He knows how to write good stories. Um, and I I would love to see what he'd be able to do with a Bond film. I think there's just... it's it, You you announce Matthew Vaughn as the director of a Bond film, completely throw everything you know about James Bond out of the book, because I think he would... He would uh, honor the character, do a lot of the Bond tropes, but he would make it his own, and that's something that could be very oh, right, interesting. Yeah. I think the um, only thing I would be concerned about it, with him is it becoming um, – t- turning Bond into Kingsman. Um, 
Yes, I agree. And that, I was actually about yeah. to mention that that would that is my only reservation. He would just th- there's a very fine line there, and he would have to make sure that he stays on the Bond side. This is a yeah. James Bond movie. We can't make it so it would, over it would, the top. It would, it would and I think he come across some because I, I mean this reminds me of like. Um, uh, but in reverse, something like J.J. Uh, Abrams doing Star Wars and Star Trek, where it's like um, yeah, he did yeah. sort of turn Star Trek into Star Wars. Um, and even, yeah, even a though he bit. did Star yeah, Wars after. Bit. And so um, I wouldn't want the, the reverse of that to happen where he turns Bond into Kingsman because it's – I mean, I doubt that they would let him do that, but it would just – it would be a distinct possibility. And yeah, yeah. I mean yeah. – Anyway, continue with your thoughts. Sorry about that. <laughs> oh, no, no, no. You're fine. You're you're exactly right on that. I mean, Matthew Vaughn. It's it's a wild card of a choice. It's a little out there. I he might be too over the top for James Bond. And once again, this is all dependent upon what kind of tonal direction well, sure, they want yeah. to take here. Because if they want to go lighter, Vaughn could be a great option. But if they want to stick with the the more serious uh, Craig esque um, tone that they've established and they've established very well, they've actually made people take James Bond seriously now. If they want to stay in that department. Matthew Vaughn probably isn't know. the right choice, but I, you know, it's it's a choice that is, you know, no duh, he made <laughs> Kingsman, which is very James Bond. Why shouldn't he be offered the chance? So that's that's why no, I that's, throw his name in there. Fair. So uh, yeah. number two, number, number two. two. Um, well, if you want to take it in a comedic direction, why not go with Paul Feig? Uh, <laughs> oh dear, can you imagine? <laughs> oh, God. oh boy, I think, oh um, man. I, I I'm sorry. Is this the next Austin Jesus Powers Christ. film it's that it's the we're next looking for here? Or, or? <laughs> <laughs> oh, but um, <laughs> no. But um, my next two are pretty interchangeable. I think this goes back to my criteria of whether or not. You know, I'm I'm actually ninety percent sure. Actually, no, sure? I'm a hundred percent sure we yeah, have the um, same okay, top well, two. My number yeah. two is I, and again, this goes in. Um, I put them in this this order, uh, one and two, because of my number two. I would like to do on twenty six. My number one, I would like to see Bond 25. Okay, well then, I think we have the yeah. same two, but just uh, in reverse maybe order. Maybe then, so my number two is Christopher Nolan. <laughs> yep, yep, that's <laughs> my number is. one. Yeah, Christopher Nolan. <laughs> okay, oh, what's your, so is your number one absolutely. Denis Villeneuve? Yes. Yep, he's my oh, number two. So yeah, yeah, so okay. I guess I'll say yep. with Christopher Nolan. Um, I, yeah, put him in number mm-hmm. two because I want to see, I want... This this one is bound, bound to happen. To happen. It's, it's it on the will cards, happen. And I'm, I mean, he's into yes. it. The like Eon's into it. It's going to happen. And I feel like it's going to happen with oh, Bond 26 yeah. because one of his stipulations yep. was, mm-hmm. I want to do it, but I want to make it my own. And what better way to make it your own than when you're starting again with a new actor? Like, it's a perfect... Mm-hmm. Exa- Tom Hardy. I mean, not Tom Hardy, but... Um, but I mean, Tom Hardy. I, I feel like his his impulses will make him pick Tom Hardy. But um, um <laughs> the whole fuck, uh, we'll just throw in Joseph oh, Gordon Levitt at that and, point. Um, M is um is uh what's his face? Um, Michael Michael Caine, Mark Rylance, oh, my, Mike, right. Michael Caine, Mark Rylance, oh boy, <laughs> Harry Styles does the Bond song. Um, but uh, yeah, actually, you know, he'd probably go with Killian Murphy or oh, something. Oh, yeah, Killian Murphy could know. be the um the albino henchman or something. Um, with the piercing yeah, glass. Yeah, um, there we go. No, so like uh, Christopher Nolan, is, it is yeah, he, it's it's an obvious pick for the next reboot, uh, whatever it's going to be, soft reboot, whatever they end up doing. Um, it, it's a no brainer. He he's in love with this franchise. Every one of his films almost sort of injects a little bit of that that sensibility, that James Bond sensibility into them. Especially like Inception and the Dark Knight movies have a lot of Bond influences mm-hmm. in them, um, which is great. Uh, yeah, I mean, it just, I don't yeah. think I need to explain this. It's I just, mean, he's, <laughs> in my opinion, he's the best director in Hollywood. So why not? Why not? Absolutely, yeah. you know, tap does, him to do a Bond big film. Films so well, I and mean, he also does like he does like yeah. thought provoking films, which is kind of where they're taking Bond in a, in a way. I mean, I, I, you'd be a fool not to see the the influence that the Dark Knight had over like Skyfall. So why not? Bring him, yeah. Why that's, not bring him in to right, continue yeah. that like sort of trajectory? Because uh, right now, I think in terms yeah. of because everyone always says like, oh, the James Bond films. I saw a lot of people talking about this when uh, Kingsman came out. They're like, oh, does this mean James Bond is boring now? And it's like, no, that's the dumbest thing I've ever heard in my life. Um, just because they're not like balls <laughs> to the wall doesn't mean they're 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 like dry generic spy films. Uh, a la like something like um, right. Not Jason Bourne. The Jason Bourne. I mean, the, the original trilogy of Jason Bourne. Maybe like the new Jason Bourne movie is a little generic. 
the new yeah. Jason Bourne. Yeah, um, yeah. It's nothing. It's nothing egregious like that. Um, I think they've almost Daniel Craig has almost perfectly struck that Sean Connery like early Sean Connery vibe where it's like it's very serious, but it's also for a yeah, modern era. Serious, yeah. but it's also got yeah. like a bit of style to it, especially now with like. Um, Skyfall and Spectre, they've hit that they're, they're not afraid to have a little bit uh-huh. of fun with it, but it is still uh, ostensibly serious. So, ostensibly, yeah, yeah. oof, that word. But, um, fancy woo-hoo, words you, here on the words, <laughs> the are, not words are not enough, even the big ones. <laughs> but, um, but yeah, no, so I feel like I'm <laughs> yes. rambling on because this is such a no a brainer decision. I don't need to really explain it. Uh, Hans Zimmer doing a Bond theme. No, oh yeah. boy, just sign me the. That dude, Sunny. I want to hear that, oh, man. I want to hear yeah, it. Yeah, I'm down. Yes, absolutely. No, and I, I'll just briefly talk about because you said a lot of the things yeah. that I'm feeling. You know, Chris, Christopher Nolan is my personal favorite uh, director at, ever. I, I think he's a visionary. He's an absolute master at his craft. He knows how to f- make films mm-hmm. perfectly. Um, and, you know, you're looking for a director who will bring a sense of style, but really understands what James Bond is. I mean, like you mentioned with his previous works, there's a lot of subtle James Bond influences oh, sure, in yeah. his works. Um, and, and like I said, he's, you know, vocally expressed. He's a massive fan. He wants to tackle a Bond film, but he doesn't want to be tied down by, from, uh, from the, the, you know, the, the, the previous films and all the stuff that they've set up and whatnot. He wants, I think that's a perfect opportunity. Bond 26, kick off this new, uh, actor who's going to be playing a kick off the new era of James Bond. You get Christopher Nolan. Um, uh, I, oh God, <laughs> please make that happen. And I, you know, and I think it's bound to happen. I really do. Whether it's Bond 26, Bond 26, Seven. It, it, it will happen. Will yeah, happen no, you're in absolutely the near right. Yeah. If there is sure. a god, you hear it here first. Uh, heard it here first, guys. If there is a god, Christopher Nolan will do one of the next James Bond movies. I'm going out on a See, going out on a go. limb Just right now. Old, There's <laughs> proof of a uh, of a of a, an almighty deity. If Christopher Nolan <laughs> does the next James Bond, no pressure, Christopher Nolan. Yes. No pressure. But world yeah. religion is on your shoulders. No, right no now. question. <laughs> <laughs> mm-hmm. and, and I think one of the things that Christopher Nolan would do, uh, not not that the Bond films really suffer from this, but he would bring more of a practicality to it. Like the 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 set pieces and the stunts would be less CGI heavy than they've ever been. Or if they are CGI heavy, you you won't even be able yeah. to notice. Um, everything will be like built. I mean, that's that's just the kind of craftsman he is. He just he does everything the in the most realistic way possible. Um. So I, w- I would just love, oh God, I would just love to see that. All right, anyways, moving on to Denis Villeneuve, who, which is your yes, number one, yeah. my number two. Purely because I w- I'd love to see him do this, this next one. I, he should do the end of the Craig era. Yes, because it would, it, it feels like the next logical director. He's got, at least when you um look at Sam Mendes' films and then you look at Denis Villeneuve's style, stylistically they are kind yeah, no, of was, similar I mean, I mean, um, visually and because so, of like the the carryover with um with uh what's his name roger deakins like visually there is a um yes a comparison right. to be made there <laughs> right exactly well and and i think the thing about uh villainu that you already touched on with um fincher is is he does aesthetic yes. really really well so if you want to get a taste for what you know, like a that that sort of like aesthetic would be like not necessarily Fincher esque, but in the same ballpark. Villeneuve is your guy. Not to mention he's probably the hottest talent right now. Like everything he's been making as of late has been getting massive Oscar buzz. It's been getting insane amounts of critical uh, mm-hmm. acclaim. Um, great stories, phenomenal performances. I, I mean, this guy is at the top of his game right now. He's like in the top three directors' work, uh, best direct. Um, he's <laughs> sorry, <laughs> he is in the top three for best directors working today. Easily, yeah. um, and I agree with you. I think he'd be the perfect choice to finish out the Craig era for all those reasons um you know if they don't tap him to do bond 25 maybe bond 27 but i really would like to see him do 25 <laughs> like he skipped 26 there like it's a foregone conclusion <laughs> no, no no that 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 belongs to christopher nolan i, I don't care what anyone says that belongs Absolutely. to christopher nolan oh boy yeah no i mean i i, I agree there's nothing that i can really add to that that um would change the discussion i just think yes um aesthetically atmospherically he is very much in line with what has been established for Daniel Craig's Bond. And he's also a very thoughtful, uh, in the same way that Christopher Nolan is, he's a very thoughtful director, a very thoughtful writer. Um, and he would give the, the character the attention that it needs 
which is something they've been really emphasizing with Daniel Craig. So it would be a shame to get a director who doesn't mm-hmm. emphasize character mm-hmm. as strongly as it has already been emphasized so far in the series. So, um, yeah, that would be right. And also, um, he does really interesting, uh, like when it comes to like moral ang- ambiguity, he definitely f- like like dabbles in that. Yeah, he does that really, yeah. really so well. Like yeah, I'm prisoners must say. and stuff like that. Like he really knows how to like touch a nerve, and I think that's perfect for someone like Bond because Bond is a, does a very morally ambiguous job. And there's gonna be some stuff mm-hmm. with Blofeld, uh, presumably in this fi- this next film that is going to be. Um, yeah, pushing well, I mean, pushing as the barriers, <laughs> which, yeah, as, as you'd hope, and uh, and if he if he does what we're expecting him to do in this film, it's going to definitely uh, test the character emotionally. And so, you know what? Let's get a director who knows how to do that, and he's one of the best at the moment. So, yeah, and nothing else I can add to that. Yeah, other than I I completely my, agree. There's no, there's nothing yeah. else to say. I mean, the guy is just he's Ugh. he's just that good. <laughs> he's just that good. I mean, <laughs> um, but yes. Anyways. So those are our five picks to direct a Bond film in the near future. Uh, let us know what you think in the comments section of wherever you're listening. And then also let us know which your five picks are to direct a Bond film in the near future, whether it be Bond 25 or onward. Yes. So, and with that, that's going to do it for uh, this episode of The Words Are Not Enough. Hopefully you've enjoyed it. We covered yeah, we a lot did. of stuff, a wide variety of topics, some <laughs> wacky stories about Roger Moore. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, if you did happen to enjoy this episode be sure to leave us a rating and a review on itunes that really really helps us out uh helps us get noticed more um and and then also the next thing you can do that will really help the show is share it with people that you think would enjoy or you know what just not even people you think you enjoy even if you're a casual bond fan i feel like you could enjoy this show we're pretty you know lax about stuff so just share it with all your friends there's um pop stars and celebrities We've got you covered. <laughs> yes. We got I- exactly. Come on. Come on there. We talk about Kingsman too. Yeah. Come on. I uh, you can't you can't not share this show with everyone. I mean it's it's great. It's quality <laughs> entertainment that Fun you should the whole family. be sharing with your friends <laughs> for the Yes, but bring the whole family. Maybe c- cover those ears for the the explicit content that we throw in there every uh, so often. But um, but then on top of all that, the next uh, probably one of the, the I'm sorry, probably the biggest thing you can do to help us out would just be to subscribe to this podcast yes. on iTunes. I mean, honestly, this is they, it's how we get you know our stuff listened to and whatnot. So if you subscribe to that podcast, your uh, new episodes are going to be uploaded to your feed immediately. Um, and who doesn't want to have a new episode for their drive mm-hmm. to work to school to anything you know for trips great stuff so be sure to subscribe to this podcast on itunes but if you are someone who does not use itunes you can also listen to this on spreaker or you can go uh watch the audio <laughs> watch the audio <laughs> that makes a lot of sense listen to the audio on youtube all of our episodes are uploaded and put on the men versus movies channel so be sure to go do that um, before I let Brody plug himself and me plug myself, you can go check out uh, all the other stuff we do on the Men vs. Movies channel on YouTube, simply by searching Men v. Movies. Uh, be sure to subscribe to that if you are interested in movie reviews and other content mm-hmm. like that. Worth checking out. Um, and then be sure to like Men vs. Movies on Facebook and follow us on Twitter simply by searching Men v. Movies. All this stuff, actually, why am I saying this? A lot of this stuff <laughs> <laughs> is in the description of the of episode, course. so just go there if you want to uh, like know where to follow us on social media. It's um, end with a, um, a massive, like it's almost like the end credits. <laughs> it really is it is i mean come on it's the it is the logical of thing course. to do here so yes. um yes but anyways brody where can the interwebs well, find you you can find me on twitter at brody cervelli the link will be in the description um please check that out i just want to let you know i uh i heard that as blowfeld cervelli yes, like my my mother's name, <laughs> but um, whatever, whatever his line was in that, in that scene. Um, but yeah, no, Brody Cervelli. Um, yeah, check it out. I'm, I'm tweeting with more frequency than I have ever tweeted in my life. So <laughs> I, he tweets, it's guys. Crazy. He tweets. It's, it's madness. I'm on the bandwagon. Um, 280 uh, characters now. Unbelievable. Oh, my goodness. Oh, 400, sorry, 480. I hope, th- I hope you get that. <laughs> I hope you get that. But yes. So uh, what about you, Griffin? Where can people find you? Where can people find me? Holy crap. That's so kind of you to ask. Uh, if you like me and you like what I have to say, you can always give me a follow on Twitter at 
Griff Schiller. All right, so that will do it for this installment of The Words Are Not Enough, and be sure to check us out next week uh, around this time or whenever you want. What do you mean around this time? <laughs> this is a live show. Just check us out next week for the next episode, and until then, we'll see you next time. Take care. Take care.